You're listening to Top Line Winnipeg with Nick and Jordan Lynham. Welcome back to the Top Line Winnipeg Jets podcast. And it's our it's our first playoff breakdown going in. You heard Jor, Colby, and I give the series preview. And I think there's a lot of a lot of good stuff kind of playing out from that. And for the first episode, you guys get a treat here. We bring on our favorite guest. She's rocking a great outfit today, too. Gotta give it to her. Liz Hood, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thanks for having me back. I, hopefully no one's tuned, turning it off now that you've announced who you're here with today. But uh, excited to talk <laughs> about um, what what an interesting past couple of days it's been, to say the least. It's It's been a roller coaster of epic proportions in Winnipeg the last three days. I'll say this quickly. Trust me. No one is complaining about the guest. Every time you're on, people are like, <laughs> Nick, make her a regular. Nick, get her on. So, hey, if you're if you're one of those people, get on Lissa's ass because we'd love to have her back regularly. <laughs> we're throwing her under the bus right here. We're, we're amping up the public pressure a little bit. Um, but, yeah, let's talk about this roller coaster. Uh, I know you've been enjoying it. You've been taking in the environment downtown. I've been doing the same, and it's – it's been a lot of fun in this city, but the one, one through two games. Let's talk about the games first. Let's go back to Sunday, a seven six hockey game for game one. How are you? How are you feeling about game one of this series? So my big kind of takeaway after that one was listen, like obviously super fun barn burner, all those great things to see. You know, seven actual goals. Um, really exciting for that home playoff crowd that hasn't had necessarily the best showing of the Jets in the last couple of years. So that was really awesome. But I think my kind of takeaway from that was I, I was feeling pretty optimistic in a weird way because the Jets were outplayed. And that sounds kind of goofy, but the whole bit has been this whole year that whenever the Jets are outplayed and win, it's because Connor Hellebuck bailed them out or it's because their defensive structure was able to manage and tighten things up and, and they only scored on a couple of loose bounces or whatever. This was the first time that I could confidently say, wow, this team totally got bailed out by their five-on-five five offense today. And that was awesome. I was really excited to see that, that, you know, we had a couple different lines going, guys were scoring in big moments and stuff like that, which is, I feel like, one of the big areas, the biggest key areas the Jets have been lacking for a lot of the season. So the fact that this is how we're starting things off, you know, the Jets are not going to get outplayed for four to seven games in a row, but the fact yeah. that they can win ones when they do is really encouraging. So I was feeling pretty good about that one. Yeah, that uh, that first game left me really, really conflicted. I, I was I was there for that game, and I think the best way I've seen it described was that was a hockey game on cocaine. Like, I still don't know what I was in the Yeah, arena. the Tony X tweet. Ex- yeah, the Tony X tweet nailed it, because I still can't process what I was in that building for and experienced the the momentum shifts, the the highs and the lows, 13 goals in a game. If you would have told me going into a single game in those playoffs uh, that Connor Halbuck let six goals in, there, I would have looked at you, and they would have won, I would have looked at, at you like you were on glue. Like, there's just no way yeah. I saw that playing out. That game really left me dumbfounded. But it, there was, like, the angle of, okay, you won playing Colorado's game coming out, out of that. And I was very curious to see what that would look like moving forward. Because in this one... Last week when we did a pre, uh, pre-series episode, we were kind of talking about how this is really a series of two stylistically completely different teams. Winnipeg yeah. at their best is the low event, structure D, go from there. And Colorado, they want to open it up. They want to be playing in transition. They want to get 46 shots on goal, which was the, the final tally in that 7-6 game for them. And yep. I felt very strongly about the idea that whoever got to their system more was going to win this series and likely those games. I did not foresee the Winnipeg Jets scoring seven goals. Now, Alex Gorgiev, thank you, sir. Uh, we owe you a couple of cases of beer in Winnipeg for that one because that, realistically, he is the reason the Winnipeg Jets left that first game with a win. So it just leaves me really conflicted on Hey, just win, baby. It's a race to four. But it was so clear that Colorado dictated where that game went 
that it was a kind of a concern. I, I left that game more concerned than I entered the series despite getting the win. Yeah, it's interesting, and, and I totally agree with sort of the prognosis that whoever, you know, gets to take control in the way that they want to play is probably going to be in better shape. But at this stage in, you know, the year when you only have these top 16 teams left, every team has the ability to eke out a win in a game that they don't really feel comfortable playing. And that's exactly what I saw. And you're 100% right that, you know, the Jennings Trophy winning Winnipeg Jets were not comfortable in a game like that. It's not that they can't, you know, open things up a little bit. Well, I mean, Mm -hmm. depends who you ask. I don't think they're very good at opening things up like that. But, you know, I guess the momentum is on their side and a couple things like that. But, um, no, I, I do not want to count on this team having to score five or more goals for every win that they have to get for the rest of the season. Um, and that's how it's, it's shaping up right now. So I definitely understand the concern and kind of feel the same way. Cause that's not the Winnipeg Jets hockey that has brought them to the, the good wins that they've had this year for sure. Yeah. And the, the interesting part about this entire game on a Winnipeg Jets level is it was almost the inverse about what we've been talking about with this team for so long when you look at the lineup and who showed up and who won their matchup versus who did not for the Winnipeg Jets. Full full game one, full praise to that top line that has been a debate for months on end at this point. That was probably their best showing as a unit in the year 2024. Contributed three goals at even strength and actually won their matchup for once like that was a big development so it was it was kind of like great to see that group step up but it also left left the concerns about okay what happened to the depth of this group now obviously Adam Lowry comes up with two massive massive goals I mean how could you not love that guy at this point he shows up when it matters and that second Sally was so hard oh so hard the first one the second is that the this one the I don't know if you can no, see that. No, that was the first that one. Was the, that, that was the first one. The second the was the point The almost goal that, was the first one? Um, oh, you're talking about the pointing at the net? That was the breakaway? I'm talk, okay, oh, okay. I'm talking about whatever one was the point at the net. That yeah. went so hard. So hard. But, again, it was an example of we talked about the Winnipeg Jets' depth over seven games is likely going to have to win them this series. And you didn't see that really show up for them outside Adam Lowry coming up big. And obviously, Vlad Nemeskov, Alex Alfalo contribute on that one goal. But the bottom three lines did spend a lot of time getting shelled in that one. Which are just thoughts on what we saw from the forward group because it it really was odd for the Jets forward group to get performances in that regard. Well, that is is the big fear and question mark, right? And that's been the whole bit is the whole, the depth and that's where we outshine, right? Because, you know, we don't have a Nathan McKinnon or Miko Rantanen on, on this team, but we have a Vlad Nemesikov on our fourth line. And I the joke for me was, and they have Miles Wood, but I guess that's not aging very well, so I'm going to shut up on that one. But no, it, it, it yeah, sure. is interesting for sure because, like, the wild card, in my opinion, is really supposed to be that to fully Monaghan Ehlers line if they're going to keep them playing in this way, right? Because we know what we're getting with the Lowry line. We know what we're getting with the Shifley line. And depending on how those matchups work, you're either having best on best or you're having Colorado come out there and know who that top line is. The way that other teams say we're going to handle McKinnon, that's what they're going to say about this is how we're going to handle Mark Shifley and that top line because that's just how hockey works. But it's the so that's why the second line, and that's how it is with a lot of teams, leaves a lot of room for for some interesting hockey to be played. And our, our second line has been the most disappointing one to me by far um, in, in these first two games that we've seen. Um, I don't buy the whole concept of playoff performers and all that junk when people choose to erase, you know, 82, 164 games of, of players' performances because they're like, oh, for a couple games in 2019, player did X, Y, Z. Um, but mm-hmm. just generally speaking, from the last two games, I haven't been super pleased with what I've seen from that line almost in any regard. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, let, let, let You know what, before we get into game two, let's get right into that convo about the second line so far. Because obviously, throughout this entire year, the conversation's been about the Winnipeg Jets top six needing to get going. You know Rick Bonus wants to use Adam Lowry a certain way, whether 
that way is the best bet against Colorado or not could probably be disputed. And we'll get into some of that yeah, later in the sure. episode. But that second line came into this series looking like the Winnipeg Jets best offensive line down the stretch. Absolutely. Since the, since they acquired Tyler Toffoli and Sean Monaghan, they had outscored their opposition 10-3. to They were controlling their minutes. And I looked at this series knowing how Rick Bonus wanted to coach it, and I thought that line was going to have to be their most impactful line for this to work well because yep. you're, you're getting them against the depth portion of, of Colorado. And so far, they've come up short, no goals. Um, I thought last night, I thought their performance in game one was not bad. To be honest, I thought Nick Ehlers was very noticeable. I thought he was creating chances. Nothing was getting buried. Um, but they weren't giving anything up. Last night, though, that line was terrible. That line didn't generate anything. Um, I'm really worried about how they've game planned that lineup in a sense where, obviously, for that line to work, we know Sean Monaghan and Tyler Toffoli aren't the most fleet of foot. Nick Ehlers was the guy transitioning that line. And yeah. the one thing that I thought was so obvious last night outside of some sloppy passes is Colorado has the speed and aggression to really neutralize Nick Ehlers through the neutral zone. They were, they were almost sending two guys at him at different ports, parts when he was trying to really ramp up and create that offensive look. And then I, I, I see the opportunities. I want to say it was 4-2 in the third. And a pat, I, I think it went from Ehlers to Monaghan, and Monaghan found Toffoli at the far end. And this could have been a three-on-two, and Toffoli's lack of feet work gets jumped over, and the Winnipeg Jets end up spending more time in their D zone. I'm almost wondering if, if that line's going to work given the tools involved in it versus what the abs are throwing at it at this point. Yeah, no, Nikola Ehlers is such an interesting one because I think – the way that Colorado is just so, and I don't say chaotic to be mean, it's in a good way, in a way that I just wish the Jets were sometimes with their puck movement in the offensive zone and whatnot. I feel like where Nikolai Ehlers thrives is, well, like you said, in the transition bit. And when you have more static defensemen at, at the top, pucks are easier to jump on and stuff like that. And that's where you can see him sort of get those breaks. And we're, we're not seeing that. And you're right that I feel like when, you know, this team obviously has been analyzing the Jets for a little while, knowing what this matchup was going to be and stuff like that. And anyone who watches more than five seconds of this team knows what a threat he is at the middle. And then, yeah, it's been neutralized. And the whole point of this was supposed to be, though, that the Jets have so many different threats that whichever ones Colorado chooses to put their eggs into the basket of dealing with, the other ones come out of the woodwork. And that's why. so if that's what's going to happen there, you need to have other guys kind of stepping up and managing and filling those gaps because that's how a lot of teams have won championships, right? Is, is when, you know, the other team is focusing on pouring it onto your superstar and your depth comes out of here. I guess maybe they've chosen to a certain degree that Nikolai Ehlers is one of our superstars and, you know, they would be accurate in that, but it's time for, for others to, to kind of step up a little bit too. Yeah. That whole line, it's, it, it's, it's fascinating because, well, we'll get there in the summer, but there's not a guarantee any of those three guys are back either. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm just throwing it out I there. Know. Like, uh, um, I'm looking at this series right now, and I don't want to revisit any trades, but I'm, I'm looking back now. And like the one guy I was super big on after acquiring Sean Monaghan was to go get Chris Tanev because I felt like we needed that Neil Pionk replacement in the top four, shelter his minutes. And I'm, I'm starting to look at this and wondering – and I'm not ready yet, but it could play out this way. I think Tyler Toffoli is a big game scorer. He's been that, and I expect that he's going to come around here. But we might look back at the deadline and say going for Tyler Toffoli and not Chris Tanev might have been the the one spot where Chevy got it wrong because I think Chevy's done a, a fantastic job the last two years. But you, you look at what's kind of the chain reaction here. Would you rather right now – Chris Tanev playing 24 minutes and Neil Pionk playing 14 with Cole Perfetti instead of what you're getting from Tyler DeFoley? Or would you rather Logan Stanley not even trusted with 10 minutes last night, Neil Pionk playing 24 and Tyler DeFoley playing 13? Like that's what that's where Bones yeah. has led this as far as the usage is going. It's it's become an interesting little side convo to reflect back on. Yeah, I'm a little befuddled by some of the choices, right? Because yeah. I 
am a believer that I think Chevy tried to probably go for, I don't know if maybe it was Chris Tanev by name or maybe more of a Noah Hannafin, maybe one of those sort of thing. I do think that there was probably an attempt to a certain degree to get more help on defense. I still yep. want to double down on saying that offense was what needed work for the Jets, but that was yep. knowing that Nate Schmidt and Dylan Sandberg were the best third pair in the entire NHL and all these things, right? And so the fact they ended up going in this direction makes sense if you're continuing to leverage the guys that you already have. But if you're using one of your six spots when you have nine NHL caliber defensemen by your books, Go including off. Billy Hanela, but whatever, Go off. waiting in the wings, and you're going to waste one of them on someone for only nine minutes is a little bit ridiculous yeah. to me. If you actually trusted Logan Stanley enough from the get-go to not get Chris Tanev, fair enough. Good for you. Use him that way. I don't think they should, but it's just a little bit of a weird kind of, it doesn't really add up to me. Yeah, it's it's interesting, and I want to get into a little bit of a discussion on whether you would make some changes going into Game 1 in Denver. Let's get into that after going through Game 2, because obviously this is our most recent game to work off of. I understand you went down to the street party. How were the vibes down there uh, on a Tuesday night, a late one, 8.50 puck drop? How was the street party last night? It was awesome. It was really fun. I on like by the end, I was starting to get a little cold, and you know, it was also starting to get a little bit annoying, whatever. But um, I had a lot of fun. Like it was good. The drink lines didn't take super long. Uh, you mm -hmm. could see the screens pretty well from almost anywhere you were. It felt just as busy as it did on Sunday. Uh, it was it was awesome. I had a really good time. Yeah, the vibes. Honestly, you got to get downtown to experience the oh my environment gosh, yeah. of the whiteout. You have to. It's uh. The city's coming together here in a way, and it's 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 cool to embrace. It's fun fun to run into strangers and get to know people. Fun to see your friends and just the collective atmosphere of twenty thousand people all wearing the same color, cheering for the same, pulling on the same rope, cheering for the same outcome. It's infectious down there. So, want to throw that out there. Enjoy this run in any way possible, but you know, try and get down there to the whiteout. Um, and yeah, this game was interesting coming into it because. I was pretty nervous about it, despite the win in Game 1. You knew Colorado was going to respond. Uh, their top guys in Game 1, especially McCarr and McKinnon, looked dangerous all night. And I didn't know how to feel going into this one. I, I kind of went in hoping for the 2 nothing lead. Wasn't going to be devastated if it didn't go that way. But that being said, this is the second game in a row where the Colorado Avalanche, for the bulk of the game, got to their system, carried the control of the game for most of it. Um, what did you? What, what's your takeaways from Game Two? Game Two is also weird, and I feel like I'm just going to say this for the entirety of the playoffs because hockey is weird. It's just a weird sport and all these things, whatever. But what I thought was weird about it was first and foremost, I thought that if the Jets could score a stinker on Georgiev early, things would open up pretty quickly. You know, the chants were going two seconds into the game. We understood what happened last game, all these things, whatever. Um, I don't want to say that he was really good because I think that's giving him a little bit too much credit. I see a lot of Avs fans that are, you know, he's back, da -da -da -da, whatever. He didn't lose you the game. That's what I'll say. You know, like it, I, he was certainly better in all these things. I don't think he was God by any stretch, but um, the fact that he was so scattered on that David Gustafson goal and then there wasn't much more after that was weird to me I really mm -hmm. thought that that was going to get him off of his game a little bit but kudos to him for for pulling through and, and getting his team through that one because that was that was good and the other weird thing um was the way I felt Colorado managed their lead a little bit and I don't know if if this is true or not but I think if you look at the shot count like they weren't shooting a whole ton. They were kind of playing keep away a little bit with the Jets, I feel like. And I think that that threw Connor Hellebach off of his game a little bit because I don't think we're really used to playing a, a keep away style team where, you know, when you're playing isolated games at a time, people are just focused on, on getting pucks to the net and all those kinds of things as they should be. But I think Colorado was a lot more careful with their shot placement um, which is, you know, if I'm an abs fan, that's a good thing. Like, I don't want all these fluffers coming in the net, whatever, bulking up the, the shot count and all these things if they're no good. But I just felt like the Jets, it was almost like one of those things where it's like it, the ice was just a little bit tilted. I mean, like, everyone just felt a little uncomfortable to me. Like, I don't think anyone liked the style of hockey that they got to play on the Jets' end. 
Yeah, and to your point here, here's something me and my brother noticed when we were watching the game last night, and it's how Colorado has decided to um, attack the Winnipeg Jets and what's opening up seams for them that uh, we both found really interesting. Now, we know guys like McCarr and Devin Taves are all-world talents on the back end. Even Sam Gerrard's a guy that could produce um, from the back end. And then you have guys like Valerie Nishkishkin, who I think has been the best forward in both games for Colorado. Just He's an animal come playoff time. Hopefully he doesn't get himself in trouble and has to disappear for the series. We'll leave that alone. Uh, but Nate Mack, they, they have guys that are very skilled with the puck and are confident with the puck. And one thing I found interesting last night is I, I did think this was a better game than game one for the Winnipeg Jets. I do think... There was more stretches in this one where you saw the Winnipeg Jets playing their brand of hockey. The first 10, 12 minutes, I thought, were a fantastic example of it. Um, what I found interesting, though, to touch on your idea that the, the Colorado was kind of playing keep away at times, I think they've exploited a bit of a, a bit of a spot with the Jets defensively. We know when the Jets are at their best, they're very tight. They don't allow many shots from the slot. Um, they work in unison. They're very good at making reads. What I find interesting is the, the abs at five on five, especially when they're big guys are on the ice, because obviously those guys can do it a bit better. They're almost setting up like a power play and having their D cross or having McKinnon come behind McCarr. And then with the one checker for the jets, they got to make a decision. Are you going to stick with Kale McCarr? Who's going to then drop it to Nate McKinnon? Or are you going to let Kale McCarr roll with it? But and death that, is not it, an option. Yeah, geez, that's a brutal. <laughs> exactly, and it's created these two-on-ones high in the zone where a Jet's got to commit somewhere, and all of a sudden it's, it's almost like, you know when Nick Ehlers has some space on the power play and he walks right down into the seam and is able to create from that? The ads are doing that on five-on-five on five by creating an up-high two-on-one, and I'm very curious to see how the Winnipeg Jets defend from that because it's also not an area where they're used to caring about that the Jets are very comfortable giving out those far out shots but Colorado's using that area to really get to the middle of the ice and generate better looks because I think I think the one aspect that is concerning is just how much quality offense Colorado is generating in the series yeah and I think it comes back to you know and you always look at it with your jaded glasses and what you wish you had they they have five players playing offense when they're on the ice, when they have control of the puck, right? Which is something that I still feel like the Winnipeg Jets struggle with. You know, like we even mm-hmm. you know, go down to the HL and you watch Billy. You know that the Manitoba Moose, all they really care about is getting their NHL caliber type of players primed to play in the NHL. And what that means is letting them run. Billy Hanela is in the crease. He's behind the net. It's all these things, whatever. And and by doing that, there's so much more chaos and movement, all these things. And I think I'm trying to remember what game it was. One of the games in the stretch of seven or whatever that the Jets won to, to finish the regular season, they, I don't know if they were just messing around or what it was, but they were doing so much more like East-West passing um, in the in the offensive zone, which is obviously more dangerous and a lot more difficult. But instead of just the ringing around the boards, high defender down to the guy behind the boards and all that junk, like it was a lot more exciting. And I was like, okay, I didn't know you guys rock like this. Like this is this is good to see. And Colorado does that all the time. And yes, I understand that there's a difference between Brendan Dillon and Devin Taves, but like it still just changes the way that you have to defend that zone. And I, I don't think I noticed that thing that you're saying about the whole higher um, up by the blue line crossing like that, but that fully tracks with, I feel like, you know, you're describing what I definitely did see that. It's like, okay, that's a really good way to sort of pinpoint some of those things that I feel like put the jets kind of back on their heels. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. Uh, The other aspect of this, I think, I think, I think it's more than fair to say Colorado's had the better chances in both games. But I also felt, and this is what's weird about this one, I did feel like this game was one or two mistakes going the other way from the Winnipeg Jets sneaking out with two wins in games they got outplayed. And and that's just the ampli- amplification of every play mattering in the playoffs. But obviously the Connor Hallibuck play happens. Yeah. That becomes the leading goal. The Kyle Connor shot, when he shot that puck, I thought it hit the back mesh. I was convinced of it. 
Yeah, and I right feel after like that, that four minute po- power play, like I know. Ag- or I know, sorry, Shifley scored right after the four po- four minute power play. Like this, and that this goal was so how- nice. Oh, it was it was gorgeous. Um, but this this series has had so much momentum shifts that yeah, the Jets the Jets all year were very good at establishing a lead and taking a game over from there, and they haven't been able to do that quite yet with the Colorado Avalanche. And that's been fascinating to me. Part of that is obviously the second line hasn't been contributing at a level we've expected. Part of that is uh, they had a great first game, but I thought yesterday was another example of the top line being overutilized and they spent a lot of time in their own end. I mean, we were seeing... A big part of that is we have the home ice advantage and Jared Bednar was dictating the game. Yeah, Jared I Bednar think- has figured out what we have seen all year, that in-game, and me and Colby kind of had a back and forth on our pre-series uh, episode where I thought I thought the chess makers in this series were going to be interesting because Jared Bednar is very, very involved in the game. Like he, He'll switch things at the tip of a hat if he sees something working, whereas yeah. you know going in, Rick Bonus has a set plan, and he doesn't deviate from it. And I think that helped Colorado – in the second period specifically, once Jared Bednar felt that game start to shift, and we saw it start to shift at the back eight minutes, let's say, of the first period, but all of a, second per- all of a sudden, second period, we're seeing Kale McCarr and Nathan McKinnon out there every second shift, and the Jets are scrambling, trying to hard match, and we're seeing Nathan McKinnon get out there against Logan Stanley and Dylan Sandberg at home. We're seeing... Nathan McKinnon play against Pionk plus the top line. All groups we don't know we know doesn't work, and we're gonna need to see some flexibility from Rick here on in-game adjustments to that kind of stuff. Because the, let's call it how it is, Colorado got what they wanted, seeing 24 minutes out of Mark Shifley and Neil Pionk in game two. Oh, a hundred percent, and I, I think seeing that line and, and knowing that you're managing them how you want to manage them. Even if you look at like the money puck, like, you know how you can put the lines on the percentage of the expected goals battle or whatever, like both teams, top lines are like below 30% or something like that. Like they were not head to head for a lot of that game. And I think that's the the traditional coaching sense is the either we're going to do the whole one versus three, where we put our checking line on their top guys or we're going to do a best on best, whatever. Jared Bednar's like, mm, I'm going to just do a little bit of all of it, and you're just going to have to be surprised by this. And I also think Colorado, because they're such a good transition team and because they had so much possession yesterday, they had so many opportunities to change on the fly and put out who they wanted against a Sheldon team. You know, Jared Bednar sitting there with his hands in his pockets, and he says, my team has, you know, nice, easy possession of the puck. Oh, there I see what defenders are out there. I'm going to throw this guy out there because that's who I want to play against. Dylan DeMello right now. That's who I want to play against Alex Iafala right now. When you have the driver's seat like that, like it changes things. And and his choice was to have those scattered matchups. And that's not something I don't think that is conducive to to what Rick is used to. Yeah. It's it's gonna be um it's gonna be interesting here because the other aspect of this, and shout out to like Avco Cup on Jets Twitter. The, the Jets all year were a better team on the road when they weren't stuck to the lineup match and they were just able to roll. And so funny. And it's so it, true. It, 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 it's funny, but it's also like, okay, we have the home ice advantage. Like, There's got to be it, – it, it astounds me that someone that is so highly regarded for what he's done in the room, what he's done with the system when, it's, when it, they play to it, that he is so slow to the trigger on adjusting to what's happening in an individual game. I that doesn't surprise me at all though, right? Because I, I know, think we've seen it all year. <laughs> and and it also I feel like is conducive to the whole building trust with your guys and all those things that help with the room management, whatever part of that is having a long leash and all those sorts of things. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, he's probably not quite as snappy because he's not wanting to disturb the forces that be and all these sorts of things because he thinks that in the grand scheme of things, keeping guys together will have a more positive output than, than switching them up and all those sorts of things. Like I think it fully tracks with what I believe his philosophy is and stuff like that. It's just mm-hmm. frustrating because at this point in the season, it's like, you can't there's there's no sacrificing the next 40 minutes of this game for the next 40 games right you're like okay i understand that you know the 
the Velarde Shifley Connor line is not working, but I really think it needs to in the grand scheme of things. And it's only January. So I'm just going to leave them and give them a little bit more time. No, there's none of that now. So I, I think it just needs to change into, and that, that is the difference between regular season and playoff hockey. And I think we need to, you know, get to that conclusion a little sooner rather than later. I don't necessarily know that it's changing the lines or whatever that sort of stuff. Yeah. I feel like that's probably a, a different discussion. I just mean agility in general. For sure. And I don't know. It's inter- I, I want to talk about some of the good in this one, though, because I want to shout out some guys that we don't normally shout out. The, the Winnipeg Jets fourth line might be yeah. their most consistent line right now. Ah, they kind of struggle in game one, but that, that's a group. David Gustafson obviously gets the goal, and Alex Ifal creates the turnover for Vlad Nemesikov's goal in game one. They're, they're filling a role. And it's the top nine, or I guess I like how Lowry's line's been playing, but it's like, do I love that matchup all ma- all playoffs? I'm not sure. But th- this team really needs to, and it's been the issue for three months. They got to find something in the top nine that works. And right now it's not. And we have three games to fucking figure it out. I mean, but also part of that, I will say this, part of that's on chasing the matchups on D. Like we, we talk about Nick Ehlers, now getting targeted in the neutral zone and struggling to transition. Who was their main deep deep pairing yesterday? Take For the guess. Jets? Yeah, who was uh, the main? The second line, who did they mostly play with yesterday? The second line mostly played with the Sandberg and Stanley line, did they not? Who are absolutely struggling themselves in that regard. Like, well, it's just, and there's a lot of things the other thing. that don't work. Dylan Sandberg has looked rough. Too like it's just not been a. I'm glad you went there. A good stretch for this this little five some there. Yeah, let's talk about the decor because right now there's one pair I I have confidence in when they're on the ice and two pairs where I am terrified every time, which is interesting because to their credit, the second pair is winning their minutes for what Neil Pionk and Brendan Dillon are winning their minutes. It's just. It doesn't, like, I don't think it's sustainable with how many times we're seeing that group, especially Pionk, turn it over and get hemmed in. It, it's, it, we're playing with fire there. No, and I think the thing with Neil Pionk, too, that scares me even more is how, it's going to be a crazy, crazy adjective, how stretchy of a defenseman is. He gets pulled out from his socks a little bit more than, than I feel like the average defenseman does. So with the team that moves the puck as much as Colorado does in a more, you know, chaotic way like I've been saying about this team like it's not good there's a lot of space that gets created when you have a guy who's getting pulled out of his socks a little bit more than than someone like a Brendan Dillon or Dylan DeMello does yeah and I think so the Sandberg stuff I think he's really struggled especially with the puck and this is something I've brought it up momentarily this year obviously he had a great year in the third pairing role it's, it's what I'm seeing right now and I've seen over the course of the year that makes me tap the brakes a little bit on the idea that he is simply going to take Brendan Dillon's job and run with it next year. We've seen a ton of third-pairing demon who you ramp up the pressure and for a guy that doesn't have the stick skills, let's call it, to handle those, those additional matchups, I'm still like leery on it as much as I love him as a shutdown presence in the third pair. Uh, part of it is, though, too, for a guy that does struggle to handle pucks and move the puck, playing on the offsides, a big, big task. And we've, we've given Logan Stanley his props down the stretch of earning a chance, bringing that physicality we hadn't seen for years. And yeah. it's clear that Bones likes that. But it's also time to be completely honest with the situation, and that is... And it, it leads into what you were just discussing with Neil Pionk, honestly. It's the same kind of idea is, yeah, Logan Stanley's throwing the body out there. He's, he's getting pulled out of position to do so. And this Colorado team is just so quick in transition and so quick at taking advantage of situations that you don't trust them to play 10 minutes. Uh, Sandberg's also struggling because of the move over. You can't go back to this. I mean, what are you, what are you doing with the decor right now? Because it also plays into the whole Pionk uh, playing too much when you have a third pair that you don't trust at all either. 
I think it goes back to the the whole argument when they first started playing Josh Morrissey with Dylan DeMello. And it was like, listen, Dylan DeMello is great. We're super glad that we're getting 20 minutes a night of Dylan DeMello, player number two, this random dude. We're super glad we're getting this. But the best part about it is the fact that we're also getting, because of that, this version of Josh Morrissey. And I think that's the issue right now is that Logan Stanley, if, if, you know, if he had to play in the lineup and they had to play him nine minutes a night, whatever. But because, like you said, of the Dylan Sandberg move to the offside, a guy who already, I feel like, lacks confidence a little bit in certain areas that are super important, especially against a team like Colorado, like the stretch pass and all those different sorts of things, you have like a double negative going on back there, right? Where it's, you know, not just one guy who isn't an optimal guy to have as one of your six defenders right now you're getting a second guy because this isn't the real Dylan Sandberg he has a partner who knows how to play on his offside who likes playing on his offside that had really positive results together and he was able to succeed a lot more on the left I just don't understand the thought process behind it especially with a team like Colorado who is not like you know I never ever ever am someone who will choose aggression over you know being good at hockey like whatever but if this was a team that had you know a bunch of those fighters that you think are going to come after guys like I understand the thought process but this is the Colorado Avalanche this is a skilled Mm -hmm. hockey team put your defenders out there who are going to match skill Logan Stanley is not the guy you need to defend against skill he is that that's like the worst outcome for him as a really skilled team to to have to try and defend against and yeah like you said Mm -hmm. if you don't trust your guys and it's obvious they don't trust your guys It's like, at least the Neil Pionk thing, 24 minutes, they're just delusional about him. But at least they believe that. You don't believe in these guys. So I'm like, what is the point when you have two other guys waiting in the wings who have been really good all year? And and the thing right now, too, is as the series shifts over to Colorado, now now Bednar dictates every single matchup. And he's going to go to his horses when he sees a chance. And... When you're talking about having two pairings with guys that you don't feel comfortable playing against better players because of the spacing, because of the overaggression, because of the turnovers, because of this, this, and this, man, going into a road barn where you have potentially two lines featuring Nate McKinnon and, and Miko Ranton, and I mean, the matchup game becomes even easier. Like Nate, Nate Schmidt has his warts, but him and Sandberg. In third pairing minutes, had been the best pair in the entire NHL in that regard. And this team does need someone that can move the puck quicker. I mean, Nate Schmidt's had his struggles with it in this regard this year. But he moves better than Logan Stanley. He moves the puck better than Logan Stanley. And in this series, I, that's one, one change I think you have to go to on the road here. Get the veteran back in. Get Samberg back on his, off, off, or his, his strong side, which, like you point out, probably the most impa- impactful part of the entire equation and hope that that line or that deep pair could hold up minutes and take away from Neil Pionk and Brennan Dillon because of the Neil Pionk stuff. I doubt we see it, but no, but right now, I, I don't think the Jets want to play Neil Pionk 24 minutes a night. Uh, I'm not convinced. I don't know. I don't think they want to ride anyone that much. Like I think, I think they would love to trust a pairing a little bit more. I just don't understand why, why they don't play the guys that we know they can trust we're, we're going into game three and i'm already ready to see josh morrissey 28 to 30 minutes because i do not yeah. have any faith in the rest and it's it's a tough situation to find yourself in you're not you're not getting the depth of offense you expected you're getting the d results you probably would have expected had the team's defense in total not be what it's been this year let's go up front would you make any changes to the forward group right now? To the forward group right now. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes, I would play the guy who's a 20-goal scorer that's sitting on the bench right now. But maybe that's <laughs> just me. I don't know. Um, 19 I, for technicality's sake. I just got to throw it out there. But <laughs> Yeah. No, I think like for the way this team is playing, like again, it's hard. I'm still team break up the top line, break up the third line. Like I still have all these things, but I understand that, you know, time to gel and all these different sorts of things. But I fully would next game just toss Cole Perfetti on the fourth line instead of Gus, you know, things like that. Like something small, if you think that, you know, you can't set things on fire yet or whatever, that's one change that I think has to be made. Absolutely has to be made. Like that he needs to be in the lineup. And I just, 
I can't understand for the life of me, you know, and it's, oh, he's inexperienced. Oh, he's little, all these things. Is it not even more impressive that in spite of all that, he's still better than half the other players in your forward group? I will scream about that one till the cows come home, um, you know, so I, I've already beat that dead horse to anyone that will listen, but that player needs to be back in the lineup when you need to score more goals, which is always. Yeah, so I'm going to, I think I'm going to take a little heel turn here. Not, not really heel turn. Most people will like this, but I've been pretty supportive of the stretch Mason Appleton's had for the last month. Uh, I have a lot of trouble taking out David Gustafson right now because I think he's really been consistently good. Yeah. And providing that job. I. Here's what I would like to see done. And it, this is never never happening. This is just conversation. It's hey. never happening. I, I would go Nino, Larry, Gus on the third line. Get two centers on that group. Um, and then I would go Cole Perfetti, Vlad Nemesikov, Alex Iofalo. Um, yeah, and I love a, it. F- here's, a few, here's a few of the reasons. Um, we're talking about the top six. The second line in particular Though the first line didn't have their best night last night. I I think that's gone lost in a lot of the conversation. You have Cole Perfetti as the the send the message switch in the lineup. Yep. If you want to get a new look in that top six. Uh, Cole Perfetti, Vlad Nemesikov, Alex Iofalo were this team's second line at the beginning of the year. And they were damn good at it. Very good at it. I've talked at length about how much I think Vlad Nemestikov's game complements Cole Perfetti's game as far as where he lacks. I think Vlad, I have no problem with Cole Perfetti being on an NHL fourth line in the playoffs with those two guys. Absolutely not. Because you get, you get a boost no to your power play. Do it. You, you get an option for this top six that's been stagnant, or the, the second line that's been stagnant. First line had a great first night. You get goals back in your line. We're talking, he's a 20 goal scorer if he doesn't get healthy. At 22 years old. Yeah. Uh, no team wants to be... I don't know if there's another team in the NHL sitting out a goal, guy with 19 goals in the playoffs. We talk about Gorgiev being so suspect right now. Send, get, give me another player that can get to him because I think he's still a loose cannon about to explode. I think you nailed it that they didn't get nearly as much shots. Quality looks on him after an early mistake as they should have. Um. And I just think he brings more upside to this team when we're talking about how important the depth is going to be in outscoring the Colorado Avalanche. He's right there. Yeah. I, he's right there. I, I totally agree. And I think if you're, you know, if, if we're going with like outlandish, whatever, line combos and all those sorts of things, I'm still team slide Tyler to fully down too. But I think as far as like my 12 forwards that I want out there, they're the ones that you just said. Mason Appleton, like, I know he's played all 82 games, he, but he's, he's playing, he's playing, he, he's playing hockey, like good for him. He is truly a guy at this point, And we have other guys who bring different things. It'll be interesting to see what happens when Morgan Barron gets healthy. I'm sure he'll go in for Gus and we'll just call it a day and all will be, all will be well. But I, especially with your gift, cause yeah, you brought him up too. like Gabe Velarde to me is going to be the ticket with this because as soon as you have a little bit of movement in front of that goalie, I swear he's kind of, all over the place and whatnot. Like I, and I think Cole Perfetti mm-hmm. brings a similar, obviously very different type of player, but just the poise in front of the net to pull a goalie a little bit extra to open up some space for yourself is something that Cole Perfetti is really good at. And, you know, we saw with the Nemesikov goal, we've seen it with, um, you know, the, the Connor goals and all that. Like as soon as there's that threat that kind of moves you out of position, like if you have someone mm-hmm. that can finish things off, you're in decent shape there. And I think Cole Perfetti is the guy. And yeah, I, I love the IFL and Mestikov line. Um, I've been really hard on Alex IFL for a good chunk of this season, but little things like that Vlad Mestikov goal with like the proper sick positioning and all those little things, like that's the type of player that he is. And I always wanted him on the fourth line and I'm glad he's there. And I think, you know, it's very telling that that was our best line yesterday. Like, Give oh, them. He's, a dog. he's he's been a dog. He's, he's been, been a, dog. a dog. Yeah. No. And I was he's when everyone else was cooking earlier this season. I was kind of like this. This guy is very take it or leave it for me. But lately, you know, he's he's been shutting me up a little bit. Which I will take that from any of the players in the Jets gladly. I'd love to be wrong and see you score a million goals a game and do all these things that I've been you know saying that you can't do. But I just I sitting on twenty goals in the press box is just 
so beyond me for a player that adds so much dimension to your team and in-house versatility for, you know, if, like you said, every now and then Bednar was putting out, okay, we're just going to double shift McCarr and McKinnon and then throw them out there, whatever. You could do the same thing where it's like, you know, you just put out the Shifley line, whatever, and it's like, oh, you want to put them back out, but one of them needs a break. Put Cole Perfetti up there for five seconds. Like, you can go out there and, and you know, provide just as much offense to that line as as some of the other options right now for a shift and all those sorts of things you have that in-game flexibility that you don't get from a guy like David Gustafson that you don't get from a guy like Mason Appleton that I think is really really important if you're going to have to match the agility that Bednar wants to run with I will say like the more I think here too I do like the idea of the Larry Toffolino thing even though it flies against what Rick wants to do because I do think this is a series where Toffoli needs the help getting to the Ozone. Like, that's where he's going to be most dangerous. And Larry and Nino can get you there, even though it's not going to be the quickest. I mean, I don't know. I don't think we're going to see any changes for game three. No. I think it's going to be, we're going to bet on this group that's going to find their game. But I actually, no, I disagree. I disagree. Nine oh, I think we see Schmidt minutes for Stanley. of Logan Stanley. Yeah, I, I think so. I I think that's the one change. Yeah. Sorry, I should have said forward. Okay, I don't yeah, think yeah. Gonna be I a agree. Change. I agree. Uh, let, let's go. Let's go to a topic I didn't think I would be introducing, but I think we got to have a little conversation. I think I know where this are, is going. <laughs> are you making a goaltender change? <laughs> Here's the thing. I cannot believe that I'm saying that I'm even humoring the fact that there are two arguments to this. And so, no, I don't make a goaltender change, but I understand Mm -hmm. wanting people who want that. I understand that there is space for that argument, which is something that I normally would never say. Um, But yeah, just because, again, same thing. You can't fire your whole forward squad. You can't do all these things, but that is one option that you have. And you know, you have a guy who can win you a game if you need him to win you a game. I Mm -hmm. am not ever giving up on the Connor Hellebuck thing. I know, I know, I know exactly what his playoff record looks like. And I said at the beginning of the episode, and I'll say it again until I die, I am never throwing out seasons worth of samples for eight random games in May that, you know, I I understand that there are different circumstances and all those sorts of things, but I am going to bet on a Vezina caliber goaltender to win me a game a single isolated game over a backup every single day of the week. And I don't think that that should be a crazy statement to make. Yeah. As any, everyone knows, I'm the self-appointed mayor of the Connor Hellebuck uh, hype train. I will die for that man. That, that guy is my Roman empire. But for the first time in my life, it actually crossed my mind. And I'm not there yet for game three. Um, but coming into this series, we were putting Connor Hellbuck on the same impact level as Nathan McKinnon, a heart level guy, uh, a major key to the series when you looked at Hellbuck versus Gorgiev. That was easily the one spot where Winnipeg should trump Colorado. Uh, I think Connor Hellbuck's bi- game's been better than the general consensus. Like we talk about how much quality of offense Colorado is legitimately generating. They've found seams. They're getting to that crease. They're getting to that net. It hasn't been easy on them. Even yesterday, the first period, looked like to me we were going to get an absolute treat of a Connor Halbuck night. Every big save was looking easy, big and boring. He kept calmed the waters like he, like he did in game one. Like He's had his moments in this series where he's come up big, but full stop, he does need to be better. You, yeah. you cannot win with Connor Hellebuck putting up an under 900. He is too valuable to this. And I don't love the idea that the narrative's back that he sucks at playing the puck because that's an area he's actually been really, oh, really yeah. strong out. It was, it was the worst mistake at the worst time. Yeah. He's got to be better. And on the breakaway goal, I think he's got to come up with a save there on Josh Manson. Oh, on my the, God, on yeah. The, on the five hole. That one, I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble and maybe people are going to say it's because I'm Ehlers homer. I don't like. I don't blame anyone on that goal. Like things things came up. Yeah. Ehlers gets stripped. He loses the puck. Six seconds left. They jump out of the box. Uh, Madsen's got a ten foot, twenty foot head start on Gabe Lardy, and it's 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 one of those plays that it's oh a hundred percent. Yeah, no. I, but I think that's a spot where you're like Connor Hellbuck, Josh Madsen. Let's get the big save. 
it's the same way that yeah it's like again yeah when when people are like oh this player had a bad game and you say why and they start with oh that one play it's like okay no like that's not how we watch and analyze hockey here like you can't say like yeah like that in that play it's like oh Ehlers had a bad game because of this or this was Ehlers fault or this was Connor Hellebuck's fault like all these sorts of things like and and that's why you think Connor Hellebuck had a bad game because he mishandled that one puck whatever no it's 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 more the continuation of, of different instances and all those sorts of things and, and I have always been like I, my, my dad and I kind of give each other the gear sometimes when I'm we're watching hockey whatever I'll, I'll be sitting there on the couch and he'll walk by and he's like oh Jets are getting outplayed. I'm like, no, they're not. He's like, oh, they're getting outshot. I'm like, doesn't matter. Like, I, I'm i not a big believer in automatically assuming that whoever has more shots is playing better because, like, quality and quantity of shots. Like, to me, it's not impressive to save 40 fluffers from the perimeter, which you never know. This is all to say um, that, like, looking at some of the individual goals, it's like, yeah, like, I, I get what happened there. But it's it's so hard to ignore the big picture of things and say, when was the last time someone won the Stanley Cup with a goalie posting below 900, um, you know, in, in these tough matchups, right? Like, it's just, it, it's difficult. And maybe that means, you know, the Jets need to give him something different, like all these sorts of things, whatever, because I still believe more in Connor Hellbuck's ability to win me my next hockey game than Russ was on any given day, in any given situation, whatever, and all those things. But there's not a long leash to figure out if that's accurate or not but it's it's hard because the the confidence piece is also like a huge bit of that like I think it would wreck Connor Hellebuck to to have a night off I really do and I'm like is that something I want to risk at this point because say Bruswell wins that game and they're like Kate we're back we're good and then now Connor Hellebuck has to play the next couple games say they win the series he's got to keep going and if he's not right in the head like whoa um so I my thoughts on this are so scattered um I I don't know what it'll take for me to say I want Laurent Brassois to play I'm not there yet but like you said the fact that we're even having this conversation means something you know yeah I'm I'm not I'm not someone that says you should start game three but I'm gonna play a little devil's advocate here on some of uh what you had to say so I'm at the point right now where I'm obviously starting Connor Hellebuck game three. This is the Vesna winner. He's going to get heart votes. Two bad games is not writing his story. But with the margin of error and how much each game means, and given Laurent Brassois' season, given the reputation he's built for himself and earned every bit of it, if we get a third straight game in a row where Connor Hellebuck is this, I'm going to Laurent Persuade game four. And it's never going to happen. The Winnipeg Jets are not going to do that to Connor Halibut. He is their franchise player. But I'm going to go the other way with this convo a little bit. So you, you kind of bring up the idea of Connor Halibut, how it's going to affect him mentally, the long-term stakes of it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use another player to kind of talk why we shouldn't do that with Con- Connor Halibut since we're doing it with others. Cole Perfetti means a lot to the future of this organization and he's had to eat a lot of humble pie and some of it deserves some of it not so much but he's had to work through that Connor Halbuck some of his best stretches in the NHL has been when he's finally gotten that push from someone below him he also has 68 million dollar reasons to shut the fuck up and be able to handle it I, I know it's more complicated than that But at the same time, the stakes are so high for where this organization is. And Laurent Persuade has answered the call every single time that if they go down 2-1 and Connor Halibut had a hand in that result, if Connor Halibut plays great and they lose 2-1, 3-2, and it wasn't his fault, I'm still going back to Connor Halibut. But if he has another off night where he's contributed to that result, I'm sorry, I have to I have to push that button. I mean, these games are too important not to at this stage and and go from there. If it's a one game thing and Laurent loses game game four, hey, guess what? You have a motivated, pissed off Connor Hellebuck, go show it. Go go prove why you're the best in the world because I believe you're the best in the world. But we the Winnipeg Jets bar none need him playing to that level. Need him playing to that level. Yeah, because and I think the thing is is too like 
you know, we could talk about how it's important not to rely on individuals that much, whatever. But the the long and the short of it is the Winnipeg Jets don't know how to play hockey with a non Vezina caliber goaltender. There's like every individual game that Brussels has had to play since December, since that random game against Carolina on a Monday night. Um, he's been lights out too. They there's been almost no change in my opinion in what I've seen from what the Jets have been getting back there. Um, you know, for for most games that we see Brussels play. And I think going down two one, um like, I don't know. I, I understand where you're coming from. Like, definitely if he has four stinkers, it's 3-1, whatever. Oh, I'm throwing all, like, that. that's a desperation play at that point. You're, you're pulling the goalie, right? Like, you're doing whatever to win that game just to keep yourself alive. That one, I don't care. Um, but game four, I still think I'd be hard-pressed. But, yeah, I <laughs> I. I don't know. I don't the know. The fact that this is a combo is telling with what what's happened so far. The fact, the fact like that pulling our combo. hair out and wanting to die over this. Yeah. No. I know. <laughs> he he he's he's allowed five goals a game in the playoffs right now. Yeah, that's not good. I mean, sources say that's not, not ideal. Not how I would have drawn it up. Um, but other than that, is there any big topics you feel we missed? Anything you wanted to touch on? Anything like that? Yeah. No. I feel like you know we we talked a lot about the main pieces, which is, you know, the line matchup and how things shift a little bit when you go, you know, down to, down to Colorado now and the goaltending piece is obviously interesting. I think we touched on, you know, what the possible changes could look like, but I think, you know, we know our coach and I think we know what we're going to see from there, but uh, I'm yeah. really interested to see how the jets come back on, on Friday. Cause like we've, we've said, and like everyone said, two games into the playoffs, you're two bad games into the playoffs. Like you haven't played, really good hockey yet. So let's see Mm -hmm. when that's coming up. You know, it's the same thing with, you know, after Connor Hellebuck had a stinker, I was like, oh, he's not going to have another one. Um, And then he did. Same thing with the, you know, the offense, the defense, whatever. After two stinkers, I don't expect him to have another one. But I said that after Sunday too. So I I really don't know what to say, but I'm I'm very interested to see how things shift a little bit, not just with the change in, in the last change in the home ice advantage, but also in the momentum shift that, you know, you're not getting out of this easy. Okay, I want to. I, I on our way out here. I want to see where your vibes are at going into Denver. Obviously, social media has been a buzz since they lost last night. Oh no, same old story. I'm not quite there. Firstly, I'll get into mine. I want to see where your vibes are at. Where do? You, how are you feeling about the Winnipeg Jets right now? And what do you think? Coming back to Winnipeg Game Five, what do you think the series is going to be at? I feel like publicly I've been very optimistic about a lot of things. Like even when I'm sitting, you know, talking on, on CBC and all these things, I was like, oh yeah, like it's totally fine guys. Like we're good. But I, I don't know. Like there's just something. And I said the cynic off camera before. I, I don't know if I'm ever going to be like fully rose colored goggles all the way bought in mm-hmm. to this Winnipeg Jets team. I know that sounds insane. And I have like, and I, I want to. And I just feel like every time they do little things like this, I'm reminded of why, you know, 10 months ago I was saying, why are we signing these extensions when we have Divincentis and Milich coming up the pipe and we can rebuild and all these things, you know, like there's still a really big part of me that was a believer in that and was proven wrong by a lot of different players and a lot of different outcomes from this season. But I like, you know, those, those worries never went away and I want them to because I want to be bought on on this team. I think they have a lot of really good pieces that could upset a lot of teams, you know, in the West if they choose to to continue to go through. But I don't know. Like, I'm definitely not going to sit with my back up to a chair for the entirety of this team's rest of the season. That's for sure. I don't mm-hmm. know how much confidence I have. But, again, it's the same thing where I, I was wrong and I will continue to be wrong with a lot of different things. So maybe this will be one of them. But I don't know. I don't know. I want to be really optimistic. I just don't feel like I'm totally there. All right. Is it coming back to Winnipeg 3-1 or 2-2? Uh, we're coming back 2-2. That a girl. That's what we like to hear. That's yeah. what we like to hear. I, honestly, I'm oddly, I think I'm, I'm normally the pessimistic one, and they've given us a lot to be pessimistic <laughs> about in those first two games and throughout the last number of years. Um. And it's, it's odd to say this, but we should be happy with a 1-1 split 
given how those games went, which isn't a, a, a positive either. But I also think there's something to the idea that this team has rewrote the narrative a few times this year that just because it's a 1-1 series and they haven't played that well yet, I'm not ready to write them off at, at this point. They're co- this is their first loss in 10 games. We're in the just win baby phase of the season. Um, there's still a lot we haven't seen from the Winnipeg Jets that if they get to, I still like where this can go. Though you could say some of that about Colorado. I think they made some yeah. really good adjustments in their game, and they still need Miko Rantanen to get going, who does fall asleep for long stretches. But don't like him. I'm just I'm having a real hard time writing this group off yet. We've seen them play better on the road. We've seen them bounce back this year. We've seen what this team looks like in their structure, and I thought we saw more stretches of it yesterday. We haven't seen their A game yet, and I guess that's where the optimism is coming from, and I believe they can get to that A game against Colorado. I'm going to say they're going to come home 2-2. We're going to get home ice back. It's going to be a best of three. The way I'm looking at this, this was always going to be a long series. I I, I predicted yeah. this call. I predicted this Winnipeg in seven. I'm not going to go haywire and get all concerned after one. Well, one. Welcome to the fucking playoffs, guys. Yeah. Welcome to the show. This is an emotional roller coaster. Every play, every game matters. So I get the investment. We're two games into a best of seven. Nut up. Have a beer, settle down, and enjoy the show. Like, we're still in this thing. It's 1-1. It's 1-1. And maybe that's what I need to hear. Because, yeah, no, I, I think you're 100% right. And it, it all it takes is a couple of guys to get going and all these sorts of things. And if you want to sort of take a step back and look at it, it's if you look at kind of, say, level playing field of where these teams are at right now, there is a higher probability that Winnipeg gets better before Colorado gets better, in my opinion, because of where we're sitting right now, what the ground zero is. Uh, and I think my maybe hot, bold take, whatever, for the next little bit is I think uh, I think Mark Shifley is going to get wound up. I think that's a player I believe in to to get some playoff goals. Um, you know, he's already starting to get that that goal-scoring touch. We know how he scores away from home as opposed to at home. We've seen what he can do in the playoffs and whatnot. And I think, uh, you know, that that momentum builder, that maybe we can get a couple goals from him and whatnot could really shift the scales uh, in Winnipeg's favor over the next stretch. I, I also think Nick Ehlers, Sean Monaghan, and Tyler Toffoli are too good of players to be held off the score sheet five more games. Agreed. Zero, they, they've scored zero goals so far. They they need to be better. And again, yeah, um, the, there's a higher percentage chance that even by accident that they'll score a goal in the next little stretch than that they won't, right? So it's yep. there's definitely more probability for things to improve than for them to even stay the same, never mind get worse. The series entered as a coin flip basically everywhere we looked. We leave two games with a five-game coin flip still here. There's a lot that needs to be fixed, a lot that needs to get better. I don't feel that confident that the chess master will get there. But I still, yeah, I, I, I still am on board that this team is going to beat the Colorado Avalanche in seven games this year. Um, on our way out here, got to announce a little giveaway. We've been giving away Fraud Squad hats every episode through the playoffs. We got three this week. Curtis, two were courtesy of our boy to, at Total Moving, Colby Kiss, sponsored the last show. I uh, wanted to kick in some more merch for the giveaway. So we got three hats here. Amazing. And, and we got a couple of regulars from the from the chat here. So I'm excited for them. Gilbert Marion, 3867, comments on all the morning afters, all the podcasts. So I'm happy for him. Shout out, Gilbert. S- send me a DM on any top line account or at Nick Lanham on Twitter. We'll get that hat sent your way. At the Temple of Boom. Unfortunately, I don't know the name behind that. I'm... I'm guessing that's either YouTube or uh, Twitter. Mikey, are you there? That's on YouTube, yep. A YouTube at the Temple of Boom. Again, reach out to Top Line Media or at Nick Lynham. We'll get that sent your way. And another big regular, at Phyllis. Um, Phyllis, Yay. get a hold of Nick. We're going to send you over a Fraud Squad hat. And we're going to give away, before the next show, we'll do another show in two games. We're going to give away a t-shirt this time. Let's get those Fraud Squad t-shirts out. 
Liz, which which of the question of the day be here? I'm throwing you right under the bus on this one. Oh, I apologize geez. for it. Like like a code word vibe. So last time we we did uh, who's going to be the X factor of the series, and okay. everybody that uh, commented an X factor mm-hmm. got an entry into the draw. So we just need a general question that people could kind of be predictive with for the next two games. Um, I think we ask how many games of Colt Perfetti against the Colorado Avalanche we'll see. Interesting. Okay, the question, top line question of the day. Is Cole Verfetti going to get into the lineup in this playoff series versus Colorado? And how many games is that? Go reply in the YouTube comments. Reply on the Twitter tweet announcing the episode. The Facebook uh, status, I believe it's still called, post <laughs> on Facebook. And you'll be entered to win a White Fraud Squad t-shirt. And thank you all for entering the previous ones. Thanks for, you know... Being a part of this, it's been cool to see more and more people getting on board. You see Liss modeling the lovely Fraud Squad sweater. She's killing it. And, uh, hey, make sure. We're going to remind the people out there. Get on Liss to do more top-line content <laughs> because we want we want Liss around as much as possible. I bug her as much as possible. So, you know, get the viewers involved here too. Yeah, well, I, um, I am – you know, easily influenced my mother birthed a follower, not a leader. So, I mean, if, if that's what the people want, then uh, maybe that's what we'll have to give them. But uh, either way, there's going to be lots of really exciting playoff hockey to talk about over the next couple of weeks. So, no no complaints on our end, I'm sure. Oh, strap into the roller coaster. There, there's a lot of hockey to, to break down here. Liz, we're going to thank you. I know the audience is going to be thanking you legit every time you come on. I get texts about it. So, thank <laughs> you for taking your free time to join us. Love the discussion as always. And thank you to the listeners for continuing to support. Um, The the embracing of Fraud Squad has been awesome. That's really become a a bit of a thing here. Um, The defense, I mentioned it last time, coming to the top line defense. Love to see that. And love to meet. I met a bunch of people in the street party and at the game. Love to do that. That's what this stuff's all about, bringing the community together, enjoying something together. So, you know, keep, keep it up. Keep up the energy. Let's uh, let's uh, let's enjoy some more of the street parties. Let's enjoy some more Jets playoffs. Jets in seven. Keep the faith. Friday night. I'm gonna tease this. I don't know if we're doing it for sure. I'm gonna get on a call with Colby right away here. But Colby, who is the Abs fan, we did the preview episode, wants to do a live stream Friday night, having some beers, us going at it as the Jets versus Colorado is on the screen. If you're into that kind of thing, be on the watch for that because that might be happening Friday night. This has been a Top Line Media production.